Okay, hi everybody. Uh, welcome again for the second uh, section of the afternoon part of the show today. So we're having uh, Jonathan Novak from the University of San Diego. We're going to hear about who was in fact the postdoc here under Ian. Yes. We're going to hear yes, about right. Kurvitz and uh, Ian and David. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here at this conference honoring Ian and David, or just Gould and Jackson as they're more often known. And indeed, I, I was a postdoc here um, with Ian, but even before that, I was actually, I was an undergraduate at the University of Waterloo as well. And so David and Ian have had a really huge impact on, on the way that I, you know, look at uh, mathematics and, and even life to some extent. And I thought that I would tell you about that in somewhat chronological order which begins in 2004 in the undergrad years when I was taking, <laughs> I was taking these two classes. So one of them was this, uh, this is the good one, but this was CNO 330, this was taught by David. And I'd, I'd previously taken uh, Math 249 with him and I knew that I really wanted to take another class with Jackson because I enjoyed it so much. And, and this was a course on, on measure and integration. And, um, and I really enjoyed this one because as anyone who's spoken to David knows, he's got this kind of, uh, wry sense of humor coupled with an undeniable air of distinction, which leads to enormous charisma, I would say, when mixed together. And, and this, this is a lecturer who shall remain nameless who didn't have those qualities. And uh, so I was really loving this class. And here we were going through the construction of Har measure on locally compact topological groups. And I, I was truly suffering. And uh, one day after class in CNO 330, I was speaking to David and I said, you know, I'm really. I, I don't like this measure and integration stuff. I never want to do it again. And, um, and he, he was reproachful and he said, you shouldn't think about things like that way um, because in algebraic common source, we use everything. And you should know as much as you can because you're going to need it down the road. And uh, in fact, he was, he was correct. Um, and, and he had made such an impression on me that I saw uh, he had a, that same semester, I believe, had a lecture in the, in the undergrad colloquium, um, which was put together by the, the Pure Math Undergrad Math Society or something like that. I don't remember the exact name. And, and the content of the lecture was just like totally incredible from the point of view of an undergraduate student. And it's very easy to tell you what the content of the lecture was. It was, it was everything on the conference poster. <laughs> that was the content of the lecture. And there was, you know, I, I really got a sense of what he meant when he said that in algebraic combinatorics, you use parts of mathematics from all over the, all over the world, so to speak, that you never would have thought otherwise. And, and of course the, the lecture was, this was the fir very first time I encountered Hurwitz theory. And um, Professor Jackson was talking about this problem from complex analysis or algebraic geometry, if you prefer, <clears throat> classical numerative geometry over the complex numbers. Um, about counting functions. So, and this was something that seemed totally beyond the pale to me. I didn't really, um, it took a while to understand. I thought of functions as totally continuous objects and it didn't make sense to me what it would mean to be counting maps. Um, but I learned from that lecture that you, if, you, if you're thinking about holomorphic maps between Riemann surfaces, let's say with the, the targets the sphere and you have some higher genus surface above or, or another sphere, then there are sets of discrete invariants that you can fix. And when you fix those discrete invariants, the actual enumeration of holomorphic functions satisfying those discrete constraints actually becomes finite. And it becomes a well-defined question to try and figure out what that number is. And, um, and on top of that, I learned that you could actually take this fact about, about uh, fixing discrete data and use it to just trans transfer this, um, this problem, which I didn't really understand very well, into something that I understood perfectly, which was just counting walks on a graph. And that graph was the, the Cayley graph of the symmetric group was generated by transposition. So it looks like this, you know, nice graded graph where these, you have the Sterling number, many permutations on each, on each level. And, um, and the counting problem that's equivalent to the problem, the geometric problem that you wanna solve over here is just to count walks that begin, let's say at the, well, really it's to count walks between two given points of this graph. So you might as well say, from the identity which end in a given conjugacy class because it's a central enumeration problem. And um, on top of that, I learned that once you got to this stage, okay, this is something that's easy to hold in your mind and to understand, but it doesn't really tell you how to go about actually writing down numbers. And there was a further transformation that I learned about, which is that you could basically turn this into linear algebra. 
So it's really basically the just the adjacency matrix actually, right? So you just uh, you're trying to count. This is my W R alpha is the number of walks on the symmetric group, which start at the identity, and they take R steps and they end in the conjugacy class labeled by alpha. And then you just take the class of alpha and you multiply it with the rth power of the class of transpositions in the group algebra. And you just take the trace in the regular representation to extract the coefficient of the identity. And that's, that's Bob's your uncle, as they say. And um, you, you just, if you want to write down something more concrete, you just take the Fourier transform, just the discrete Fourier transform for the symmetric group. And you get this formula for these, these numbers. This is the, actually, this is the disconnected single Hurwitz number. Um, where you, you know, you're summing over young diagrams. This is the, the Plancherel measure. So the push forward of uniform measure under the Fourier transform. And this is the eigenvalue of the class C alpha um, acting in V lambda. And there's a really nice formula for the eigenvalue of the class of transpositions in, in a given V lambda, which goes back actually to Frobenius, which is you just add up the contents of the young diagram alpha. And so this is actually quite explicit. Um, and uh, I was really taken by this and, and I, but I realized that actually I hadn't quite understood um, what Jackson was saying, or this wasn't really what I had expected. What he was doing wasn't so much using combinatorics to go out into the world and solve interesting problems. What he was doing was he was taking an interesting problem from the outside world and dragging it back into the realm of combinatorics and just beating it into submission with everything that algebraic combinatorics has to offer. And uh, I really liked this idea. And I, I knew that I wanted to pursue things like this. And uh, okay, right. So this is the other side of things. This is at some point we all learned the exponential formula. And this is like, this is the original exponential formula. This is where it came from in, in Hurwitz's work. So when I drew this surface before I drew a connected surface and this you can, you can uh, lump together a complete generating function for all the walks on all the symmetric groups where Z is your exponential marker or Z, Z, sorry. I, I'm starting to lose my Canadianness. is your exponential marker for the degree of the symmetric group. And this H bar is an exponential marker for uh, the length of the walks. And then you have ordinary markers for the uh, cycles of the conjugacy class where your walk should end. And um, yes, okay, about this H bar, the, the golden Jackson notation is, is T not H bar. Why would you use H bar, this, this Planck constant? And it's so somewhat offensive to mathematical eyes, but what happens um, is that these sorts of generating functions are actually important in mathematical physics, and um, and, and physicists care about them. And, uh, and you know, it's a different community; they don't have exactly the same um, standards that we do in combinatorics. And Goulden and Jackson have been subject to this kind of treatment before too. They'll they'll take your result and they'll change the name of one of the variables to H bar, and then they just won't cite your paper. And so if you want to have some chance of precluding this kind of rough treatment, you can maybe just start using H bar from the beginning and at least they can't do it with a, with a clear conscience thing. And, uh, <laughs> okay, so, um, and this is the Frobenius formula. Okay, so here I'm taking the Frobenius formula, uh, which I showed you the character formula for counting walks on the symmetric group and rewriting things in terms of sure functions. And you get this form of the generating function and if you want to extract the generating function for actual connected Hurwitz numbers, you just take its logarithm. And that's a fact that was, that was um, developed by Hurwitz, and it's the, the ancestor of the, the more general exponential formula that we all know and love and, and use every day. Um, so this is the, the single Hurwitz problem, where you're looking at walks um, from the identity class to a given conjugacy class alpha. And... Um, and, uh, and this is a you know, kind of really nice way to extract connected information. And also I remember when I saw this, I felt I had a, a kind of a, another understanding of why logarithm tends to make things small, which was <laughs> quite appealing. And, um, and there's, a, there's even a more general version of this problem where you try to count walks on the symmetric group between two arbitrary classes. So between C alpha and C beta. And so you can form up exactly the same type of generating function, but now you have two alphabets of ordinary markers. So I'm, I'm thinking of these as the power sums in some underlying infinite alpha, countably infinite alphabets A and B. Right, and so this is the generating function for disconnected um, double Hurwitz numbers, which means just counting walks between two given conjugacy classes on the symmetric group. And you take its log and you get the actual double Hurwitz numbers, which are counting, um, counting branch covers where you can have arbitrary ramification over two points, let's say the, the two poles of the sphere, 
and um, uh, that, that have profiles alpha and beta, which are free to prescribe, and then are additional simple branch points, and those correspond to the, the steps that you're taking in your walk on the Cayley grass. And um, so these are very nice formulas, and they, they, they stayed with me as I went into um, graduate school. And so I was a graduate student at Queen's University, which is um, kind of up the road from here, halfway from here to Montreal. And I, I wasn't actually um, doing combinatorics at all. Uh, I was working on uh, my, my PhD supervisor, Roland Speicher, was really an analyst. And he was, he, he was working on free probability, which I won't go into. But a problem which comes up in that subject is the computation of what's called link integrals. And these are actually kind of important objects in, um, in, in quantum gauge theories, actually, uh, quantum chromodynamics, which is, from a mathematical point of view, actually a subject that basically reduces to computing integrals of this type. So this is an integral over the, uh, the unitary group, so n by n uh, complex unitary matrices. And you're trying to integrate a word in the elements of that matrix um, and its adjoint against the Haar measure. And so this was really, uh, yeah, it was the Haar measure. Um, just exactly the, so there's this um, Chris Rock bit that he does, which is kind of silly, but also kind of funny, which is that it's, uh, it's not a good idea to have any kind of uh, prejudice towards any particular group of people. And his argument is not a moral one, but rather a practical one. And it's a, whatever you don't like is gonna wind up in your own family. <laughs> and, uh, and this happened to me with Har measure. Right, so I really didn't like it. And that, that's, this is what I worked on for basically my entire PhD thesis was the computation of integrals of this type. And it, it was a well-known fact that what you could do when the rank of this unitary group N is bigger than the degree of the monomial in, in U's and U bars that you would like to integrate, this reduces to just computing integrals of a special form where you take the, you know, the diagonal elements of your, of your unitary matrix U and you kind of superimpose over, um, over your unitary matrix U, let's say it doesn't matter because of the invariance and hard measure, but like in the upper left corner, a D by D permutation matrix, and you'd sample those as your U bars and you try to integrate this, this expression. Um, and it's, there's, you know, what can you do? There's no, like, there's no fundamental theorem of calculus or anything like that. Um, so how do you compute integrals like this? It all really comes down to kind of clever manipulations of the invariance of hard measure together with a substantial amount of Lie theory. Um, and what was known is that you could expand such an integral, uh, what's called perturbatively, and small, the small parameter is one over N as the rank of the unitary group, um, into a power series, which actually does converge when N is big enough. And the first term in this power series is a really interesting um, object. It's, it's familiar to combinatorialists. It's the product of Catalan numbers, uh, minus one in the index, corresponding to the cycle type of, of alpha, which is the cycle type of this permutation pi that you're trying to integrate. So the first term in this power series expansion, which evaluates these integrals was known and everything else was unknown. So basically what was, you, you might've heard this morning that if you're trying to understand integrals in quantum field theory, then what, what this often comes down to is you just have to find the right class of Feynman diagrams that index the terms in a perturbative expansion. And what was not known about these integrals was what were the Feynman diagrams. Okay, and this suggested that there, there should be something nice. And, um, and that something nice actually is again given by this graph that we saw earlier, the Cayley graph of the symmetric group, except with some additional um, information. And that additional information is an edge labeling, which I'll call the UC Stanley labeling. And so what you do is you take every edge, which corresponds to um, swapping the numbers S and T, and you label it with T, the larger of the two numbers that are interchanged, and so here, here it's color coded. So these are swaps with two, swaps with three in magenta and swaps with four in black. This gives you this, this nice picture of the symmetric group. And this labeling wasn't, he didn't say it like this. Was, okay, this is what it looks like in general, right? Why is it called the UC's Murphy or UC Stanley uh, edge labeling? I'll, I'll tell you the UC's part first. So this is what it looks like in general, right? So you have one, two edge coming out, two, three edges, three, four edges all the way around for D, um, D, minus, or, so D minus one D edges, it gives you a D choose two. And that what that really means is that you're, you're um, grouping together uh, the, the um, transposition generators of the symmetric group into a matrix in kind of the natural way and thinking about the additional information about which column do they lie in. And in fact, the, the column sums of this matrix are special elements in the group algebra of the symmetric group, which are called the UC's Murphy elements. So this is 
Some of all swaps with two, some of all swaps with three, some of all swaps with four, and so on more generally. And why would you think about such a thing? Well, it's a really interesting fact discovered by UCs. So normally, like what you, you're often doing in, in, um, in the land of Goldman and Jackson is that you, you're, the fact is that factoring permutations is very far from unique. And uh, so you, what you want to know is for a given permutation, how many factorizations are there which lie in some certain class that you'd like to prescribe. And UCs went the other way. He found such an enumeration problem where the, <laughs> where the answer is one. And the answer is always one. Um, and this is a unique factorization theorem for permutations. And it says that every permutation pi factors into a product of transpositions in one and only one way. If you make the constraint that the, uh, the swaps, the larger elements that are being swapped form a strictly increasing sequence. Okay, or, and moreover, the length of the, the number of, um, of factors in such, a, in such a factorization is equal to the, the word norm of the permutation pi. And um, so, so this is how this looks for this graph that, that I told you about earlier. You keep all strictly monotone walks, which are emanating from the identity permutation. And what you get is this nice tree that grows up the, oh, question, yeah. Uh, it, okay, so it's the, um, uh, what's the algebraic combinatorics word? It's the, I don't know, it's the minimal number of factors that, okay. Yeah, the length, the length, thank you, the length. That's right. Does that clear it up? Okay, all right. Um, and so another way to say this is that the, the levels of, of your Cayley graph of the symmetric group these are actually, so if you think about the definition of these UC Murphy elements, if you evaluate the Arth's elementary symmetric polynomial in these UC's Murphy elements, an equivalent statement is you're going to get the Arth level of your, of your Cayley graph. And on top of that, so not just this nice way of kind of thinking about the symmetric group as being grown up in this tree-like way, there's a, a corresponding result on the algebraic side that UC's found, which is that what's going on here, because of the fundamental theorem of symmetric function theory, Right, even though these, these UC's Murphy elements, they are not, they do not lie in the class algebra. They're not central. They're not linear combinations of conjugacy classes. But when you plug them into the elementary symmetric functions, you get just the sum of all conjugacy classes indexed by Young diagrams with a given number of rows, which is that, like the most central type of thing you could get. And so what you have really is a specialization from Lambda into the class algebra of the symmetric group from symmetric function, sorry, from the class algebra of the symmetric group of any degree D, and what you're doing, it's, it's a funny specialization where you're plugging in elements that don't actually come from here. They come from a larger commutative algebra containing it called the, called the Gelfand-Setlin algebra. And um, you, plug, you plug these into any symmetric function you want in the tail of zeros, and you're going to wind up with a linear combination of conjugacy classes. And so what that means is that any element of this form is going to act just by Schur's lemma as a scalar operator in any, in any V lambda, in any irreducible representation, and there's just this completely amazing formula for what the eigenvalue of the scalar, of the scalar operator is. You just take your symmetric function F and you specialize it on the content alphabet of the signature of the, of the um, representation. So basically what this is saying is, you, you know, you would love to know what are the eigenvalues of conjugacy classes acting in irreducible representations, and, but you will never know because this is the characters of the symmetric group and there's just not any simple formula at all. Um, but if you kind of think about a, a, an inverse problem of constructing elements where you can find their eigenvalues acting in irreducible representations easily, this gives you a huge class where you can do this. So for example, the eigenvalue of the rth level um, acting in, in, um, in the irreducible representation uh, V lambda is just ER evaluated on the content alphabet of lambda. Okay, and so you know, there's lots of things you can see from this, right? Because uh, so I, I showed you the E1 case of this before, right? So level one is all the transpositions. And uh, let's see, what else can you see? If you take the top level, that's the conjugacy class of all um, full cycles. Okay, and if you wanna take uh, this elementary symmetric polynomial and you're evaluating it on the content alphabet of, of lambda, then what you need to be certain to happen that you don't get zero is you can't have two boxes of content zero right, because that's the top degree elementary symmetric polynomial. So you better not have two diagonal boxes in your Young diagram, which is exactly the fact that the, the character of a cycle vanishes in everything but a hook representation. 
So lots of things you can see from this point of view. And, um, and in, in, a, in a paper on, um, called, uh, called Non-Costing Partitions of Parking Functions, um, Richard Stanley looked at, at a kind of a, a variant of this where he took UC's unique factorization theorem and instead of looking at all strictly monotone factorizations of a permutation, he weakened it to just your, your larger elements being a weakly increasing sequence. And when you do that, then you no longer have unique factorization. You're back in the situation where you want to know how many factorizations do you have. And, um, and what he figured out is that the, the set of signatures, so like when you take your walk from the identity permutation up to the long cycle, and you encode the labels of the edges that you hit as you do this, you get exactly the increasing parking functions on the alphabet two to D. And, um, and from this, you could deduce many things, in particular, the Catalan many of these factorizations. And uh, actually, I'll say a bit more about this later, but this suggests that actually it's, um, we saw Catalan numbers already in the context of another problem. And it, it suggests that, that maybe what you would want to do is look at all monotone factorizations, not just of the full cycle, but of arbitrary permutations. And so it's a simple observation that what you're doing by doing that is you're looking at the complete symmetric function rather than the elementary symmetric functions. You take the complete symmetric function of degree R, you expand it in the UC's Murphy elements, and you just pick out the, the coefficient of what are, whatever permutation you're interested in in that expansion. And that's going to be the number of R-step monotone walks leading to that permutation. And because of UC's theorem and, and the Schur, Schur lemma, you have a character formula for, for what these numbers are. Doesn't necessarily mean you can evaluate them, but the character formula is, is you know, reasonably tractable. And in fact, this, um, this um, transposition enumeration problem is the answer to this question about how to evaluate these integrals. So in fact, the perturbative series of these integrals, their one over n expansion, is exactly counting monotone walks. Okay, so if you want to know um, how, how, what the value of this integral is, you have to add up, actually it looks like an alternating series, but actually it's not, right? So all its terms are either positive or negative just because permutations have signs, they're even, either even or odd, um, of these numbers. And, and these, so basically what this is saying is that um, monotone walks in the symmetric group are the missing Feynman diagrams for evaluating integrals of this kind. And if you want the corresponding Feynman amplitudes, which are the coefficients in the one over n expansion, you actually have to count the walks. So the walks do the indexing and if, counting them is, is giving you the value of the integral. And so that's pretty, um, pretty interesting. It was the main result of my PhD. And, um, and Ian was, uh, so I was telling this to my um, supervisor. He sort of said, I don't really know what you're talking about. I'm gonna call up Ian Gould and get him as a external, external for your defense. And so Ian came and um, it was a uh, uh, difficult time is right during the financial crisis and postdocs were scarce. And um, I guess he was interested enough that he said, okay, I'll, I'll take you as a postdoc at Waterloo. And so I came here, I came back to Waterloo and I was working with, with Ian and, um, and Mathieu on, on sort of the ramifications, uh, pun intended of this, of this um, problem. And um, so what was clear is that you could sort of do the same thing as Herbert's theory under this monotonicity constraint. And it had an, a kind of an interesting plug-in um, with these integrals from random matrix theory or quantum field theory. You could form up exactly these generating functions from monotone walks of arbitrary length, arbitrary number of steps, um, or, or the, the double version of this problem where you go between two arbitrary conjugacy classes, right? And you see here, because it's monotone walks, this product before that was an exponential of contents is now you're summing up um, um, complete symmetric functions and contents. So you're getting something that looks like a bunch of geometric series multiplied together because that's the generating function for complete symmetric functions. And so I, I wanted to call this monotone Herbert's theory. And I started writing it with this, this uh, arrow over the H to indicate that it was a sort of desymmetrization of Herbert's theory. And so this was in 2010, 2011. And then in the 2016 um, presidential race in the US, the symbol emerged, and uh, but we were first. And I've always wondered, I've always wondered if there was uh, some connection there. Anyway, um, okay, right. And so it's the same kind of thing. You you can take the logarithm of these generating functions, and, and you know it's an important point that this actually still works, right? Because now this is an ordinary marker. This this awful h bar is an ordinary marker for the number of steps, no longer an exponential marker, but it's a fact that the, um, the exponential formula still works, taking the log of this thing um, could, uh, um, extracts the connected version of the problem 
which defines for you the uh, monotone single and double Hurwitz numbers of genus G. They count monotone factorizations whose steps and endpoints together generate a transitive um, subgroup of the symmetric group, act, act, act transitively on, on one through D. Okay, and um, so, you know, it seems like an interesting thing to develop this, this um, desymmetrized Hurwitz theory. And so when I first got here, I was um, you know, meeting with Ian once a week and I was basically telling him the results from my PhD thesis. And he was, he was interested, but I could tell he was a little bit, you know, on the fence whether he himself wanted to get involved or just kind of let me do my own thing. And uh, I wanted to get him involved. So I, I went back to the lab and I, uh, and I found a join cut equation for, for counting these number of monotone factorizations. Um, so this is a recursion that completely determines the, these numbers. Um, so this is just a, this is a young diagram with M rows. And, um, and this is, you know, I knew, <laughs> I knew that Ian liked joint cut equations. This is another thing that I learned from, um, from Jackson's famous seminar in 2004. And, uh, and it, what I did actually is I used the invariance properties of Haar measure to get this recursion um, as opposed to doing it combinatorially. And I showed this eventually to Ian and that, that did it, that pushed him over the edge. And uh, he decided to invest in this problem. And I've been enormously grateful that he did. And it was just like, like a bloodhound. I mean, like he, he had the scent <laughs> and he just went. I mean, this was exactly um, everything that he needed to just completely understand how to solve this problem. And with his guidance, we were, we were Mathieu and I were able to um, accomplish a lot of that. And it just would have been totally impossible um, without his instincts and without his, his virtuosity for, for working um, with the sorts of generating functions that come up in an endeavor like this. And, um, and so what we were able to do essentially was to rebuild all of Herbert's theory underneath this monotonicity constraint. So we were able to find, I, I stand by this statement, we were able to find a, an analog, a monotone analog of absolutely everything you can tell me about monotone, about Herbert's numbers, I can tell you a monotone analog. And, um, the key to this was a much better version of the, um, of the um, joint cut equation that I had brought to Ian's office. So this is what it looks like at the level of the full partition function, right? So you, this is all monotone, all single classical Hurwitz numbers. And this is the, the classical uh, Gould and Jackson joint cut equation determining this gener generating function uniquely recursively as a partial differential equation with a given initial condition. And, um, and Ian, you know, he translated the monotone recurrence into a version of this, which is actually, it's the same joint cut operator. There are lots of reasons for that, but initially the reason is that that's just how it worked out, um, except that it's, it's actually a differential difference equation that you get. But nevertheless, it's the same kind of thing. This positions you to, um, to use a very sophisticated strategy in algebraic combinatorics. Which, which is called guess and check, which is you, uh, you try to guess a formula for the thing you want to count and you plug it into your PDE and you see if it actually is annihilated. And, um, and that's pretty hard actually. Uh, yeah, I'm not doing it the right service, but, but um, Mathieu in his PhD thesis, you know, could do anything like this he could do. It was pretty amazing. Um, and so we could get explicit formulas from, from this framework. So here's the, Here's the conference poster, right? This is the Golden Jackson formula for uh, genus zero Hurwitz numbers, minimal transitive factorizations of permutations into transpositions. And here's the corresponding formula for the monotone case. And you can see it's really, you know, what we talked about earlier, basically you look at this right product of, of Cayley tree numbers, you know, it's a, which count minimal factorizations of permutations, modulo shuffle factor or something like that. It's a generalization of that. And here you, you more or less have Catalan numbers, okay, which is, which is counting these labeled versions of these paths where you have to have this increasing property. So that's the genus zero formula. It's already pretty complicated, but it's nice to see the parallels. Okay, this is, <laughs> this is uh, the next level up, genus one. There's this totally crazy formula of, of Vakil that gives the genus one Herbert's numbers of arbitrary cycle type. Looks like this. And, um, and indeed there's a monotone analog that you can extract, which again has, has many structural similarities. Basically exponents are, are replaced with rising factorials and, and Cayley-like stuff is replaced with Catalan-like stuff. And, um, 
more or less. And, uh, and so this is just a sample of the type of things that exist in this world of monotone analogs. They're very advanced ones that I really won't talk about too much. And uh, for example, there's something called the ELSV formula, which has been kind of a major um, driving force in enumerative geometry in the last couple of decades, which expresses classical Hurwitz numbers as integrals over the deline mumford compactification of the moduli space of curves. And, um, and there is such a formula for the monotone Hurwitz numbers as well. It wasn't found by us, it was found by, uh, um, by um, Alexandrov, uh, Lewanski, and Shadrin. And, uh, and uh, those same authors also showed that the monotone Hurwitz numbers satisfy something called topological recursion. Also, won't go into that. It's actually basically equivalent to this statement, um, which is something else which was known to be satisfied by the classical Hurwitz numbers. And the parallel continues in that we basically don't know anything about <laughs> double Hurwitz numbers. Um, maybe that's not such a correct statement. You'll probably see something in Renzo's talk, which, which uh, uh, refutes that. Um, and we uh, similarly, we don't really know anything about monotone double Hurwitz numbers, at least I don't know anything. Um, okay, and here's some stuff about higher genus that actually I do, I do want to emphasize, which is let's go to the case of simple Hurwitz numbers, which is even simpler than single Hurwitz numbers. These are loops. These are monotone loops based at whatever given point you want of the Cayley graph and try to count those. So that means your, your generating functions become univariate functions. There's just one marker for just a degree, okay? And, um, and, and what it turns out is that for any genus you like, this univariate generating function is after a change of variables, always rational. Actually, so Mathieu, you know, he, he found a version of this that works for single Hurwitz numbers, but I'll just emphasize the, the, the simple version where you just have one indeterminate. And this, each of these generating functions, the, the thing that you, um, when you make your change of variables, the S that you want to use is actually something that's basically a certain normalization of the Gauss hypergeometric function. And so what this tells you right away is that if you, if, if you start to think about these things, you can think about them as analytic functions in kind of a uniform way, even though your genus is going up, which means there should be more and more of these factorizations as you increase the genus, these numbers are getting bigger and bigger. Nevertheless, they have the same um, exponential order of growth. And that exponential order of growth for any genus is two over 27. And um, so you can think about this thing as a family of holomorphic functions on, on an open disk centered, they have a common dominant singularity on the, on the positive real line, just by Pringsheim's theorem at two over 27. And, um, and so, uh, right. And this brings me to another one of my, my uh, no, wait, yes. This is what I wanted to say next. Uh, a little short on time, so maybe I won't explain this in too much detail, but the fact that you know that you can't actually get the radius of convergence, but you can prove that the same fact is true um, for single and double Hurwitz numbers. And you can do that by basically being able to estimate, not, not exactly um, write down a formula, but you can estimate an upper bound on, on the single and double case in terms of the simple case. And using a version of actually of, of, of Hurwitz's break group action on, on, tract on branch covers, every time you add a new branch point, your, your summability um, radius of convergence drops by two. So if you want single Hurwitz numbers, the radius of convergence is at least uh, one over 27. And for double, it's at least one over 54. And um, we actually suspect that it's two over 27 in both cases as well. And so about this two over 27, this is another, so approximately uh, half of my vocabulary or at least some non-negligible fraction comes from, from Professor Jackson's uh, lectures while I was an undergraduate. And, um, and one word that always stuck with me was heruspication which means to, uh, to, to portend the future by examining the entrails of an animal and um, <laughs> practice in ancient Rome. And uh, so here's some heruspication, heruspication. The entrails of the animal are two over 27. And here's something that I can tell you about this number. This is an interesting class of inverse problems where you know, I give you a number and you tell me everything that this number could possibly mean. And uh, so let's try that with two over 27. Here's one other interpretation. Um, Think about the number of finite groups of order P to the N, where P is an arbitrary prime. Um, okay, up to isomorphism, obviously. And um, it's, it's an old theorem of Graham Higman that the, the growth of this sequence is a function of N as N gets large is P to the two over 27 N cubed. Um, 
Don't know why, but if you do, I would love to know. It's bothered me for years. Okay. And um, so this is like the last uh, phase of the talk here. Um, 2014, what can you do with this monotone Hurwitz theory? It's sort of really nice that it worked out in this way. And, um, and of course, the, the, the natural thing to do is I, I told you that these sorts of monotone walks are actually the Feynman diagrams for integration um, over, over the unitary group. So maybe you can go back and actually use this powerful machine that you've built up. And, um, and in fact, you can, and you can use it to quite dramatic effect um, on some important integrals from mathematical physics called the Brzezant Gross Witten uh, integral and the Harsh Chandra Tusen Zubair integral. And okay, I'm just not going to go into too much detail because I'm almost out of time. These are these integrals. Okay, they're, they're integrals over the unitary group. Don't worry about it. Look at this part. These integrals have a character expansion. You can write them down as sums of sure functions. And what you're getting is exactly the sure function expansion of the generating functions for the monotone. Uh, single and double Hurwitz numbers that I showed you earlier, probably don't remember, but take my word for it. Um, modulo the fact that everything is now finite n, right? Because we're summing over the characters of un or glnc if you prefer. And those are indexed by Young diagrams with the most to n rows. So you need this description, um, length of lambda is less than or equal to n. And it's not just, you can't just rely on the fact that s lambda vanishes um, when you have more than n rows, because you see here, you have this product over contents divided by n. And if you try to use this on a Young diagram with more than n rows, you're going to be dividing by zero here. So you really need this constraint. And somehow what you would like to do to analyze these integrals in the large n limit is to remove this constraint. And that proves to be quite, quite a beast. Um, and before I tell you about how that is done or what can be done, I just want to emphasize that these, these integrals, they might look like they come from a totally foreign place. But uh, you know, according to Jackson's principle, of course, they're related to algebraic combinatorics. And the relation is, is very direct, especially in the case of, of the Harsh Chandra integral. And in fact, not only is it a sum of sure functions, it actually is a sure function. And so this is a formula due to Harsh Chandra that probably should be better known in algebraic combinatorics than it is. And it's, it's an integral representation of the irreducible characters of GLNC. So the normal way that you think about sure functions is really the, the vial formula. And this is the, the, the first version of the Kirillov constant character formula. And what it says is that the normalized sure functions are basically equal to this integral. All right, so this, this, these are the eigenvalues of your invertible matrix, some, some non-zero numbers. And this is, a, this is a way to look at sure functions, which is not often used in algebraic combinatorics, but can be used quite effectively. So there was a conjecture of uh, Cutler, Green, and Skandera. This is one example from some years ago, where they proved that dominance order is exactly the same thing as saying that the nor normalized Schur functions are, um, are increasing on positive arguments. That actually characterizes dominance order. And uh, the way this conjecture was proved was actually uh, uh, was proved by Subrit Sra using this Harish Chandra formula and writing sure functions as integrals, and it becomes almost trivial to prove it from that point of view, but no one had really thought to try it um, up until that point. And this is actually quite an interesting direction of research. There are generalizations by um, Apoorva Kerr and Terence Tao um, to weak majorization and to all root systems was done by um, Colin McSwiggin and myself with a different notion of majorization, which I won't get into because I'm short on time. So uh, I just wanna advertise that integral formula for the sure functions, it's a good one. And what was it that physicists wanted to know? They wanted to know the large uh, n behavior of these integrals. And they predicted that they should have a topological expansion when n goes to infinity, which means that they have asymptotic expansions you know, in n to the power of the Euler characteristic of something, but they didn't know what that something was. And uh, so, there's, so there was some unknown uh, combinatorial invariance that they really would like to know about for their various diabolical string theoretic purposes. And, um, the answer has to be has to be monotone Hurwitz numbers, right? I mean, the connection is so so strong that um, that it's it's just got to be the case. Uh, unfortunately, it's the case formally, <laughs> and uh, right because remember, there's this. Oh, I, I forgot to right. So there's this constraint that you're only summing over Young diagrams with um, with at most n rows, and these are s lambdas evaluated on alphabets of n variables, and that's exactly this integral. And you would like to take n to infinity. Okay, um, and you can't really do it, right? You can do it term by term. This is like you have a sequence of analytic functions and you're able to predict 
uh, that depend on a parameter n and you're able to predict the, the limits of each of the derivatives, that does not mean that you know the large n behavior of the function itself. There are you know, various examples that tell you that you don't, um, standard examples from analysis, but here's a maybe a more conceptual example. It's exactly like, this is a major obstruction, it's exactly like Bach periodicity, right? So it's, it's again about the unitary groups. Suppose you want to write down um, the, um, the fundamental, the, um, the um, uh, what's it called, homotopy groups of the unitary groups, you can sort of do the first few, increasingly many for each unitary group. And then after a certain point, it's like actually unknown even today. But if you let your group become large and you just want to know any fixed homotopy group, it just stabilizes to the famous, you know, uh, uh, integer zero, integer zero sequence that, that is the, the hallmark of bot periodicity. So like, if you want to take limits this way, that's fine. But if you want to take limits like this, that's an issue, right? And uh, I guess you could say, so normally when you're trying to, you have a generating function and you start to treat it as an analytic function and you use complex analysis, I hear the thing to do is to say that you're doing analytic combinatorics. And um, you could say this is extreme analytic combinatorics because you really know, you know, neither actually the combinatorial objects in complete uh, specificity that you're trying to analyze, nor do you have closed forms for their, um, for their generating functions. And on top of that, this is not just analytic combinatorics in several variables, it's analytic combinatorics in an exploding number of variables. So not, not only is some parameter going to infinity, actually the number of variables is growing without bound as well. So it's, uh, it's pretty extreme. And um, it took a long time to uh, overcome these sorts of difficulties. And actually, so this became ultimately a, a kind of an incursion. Again, another, another example of, of, the, of the Jackson principle, you just, you, you use whatever you have to use. And this became an, an excursion into, um, into several complex variables and, and other parts of analysis that I won't torture you with. And, uh, you know, okay, just ultimately the, the uh, end of the story is that the conjecture is true. These, these integrals actually do admit these one over n expansions. And what you suspect would be the case that their monotone um, double Herbert's numbers actually is the case. And it all does, it all does work out in the end. And it was a bit of an ordeal, but um, um, happy that it came to fruition. And um, yeah, okay. So this is what the theorem looks like in full. All right, I'll, yeah, I can tell you about it later if you wanna know more. And that's it. So I just would like to say thank you to uh, to um, to Gould and Jackson for um, for for passing on uh, their their knowledge. I, I absorbed only a small fraction of it, but even that small fraction that I managed to um, internalize has served me extremely well. And uh, I'm sure that many other people in this room can can say the same. And uh, so thank you very much, Ian and David. And, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much for this sure. really great talk. Do we have, we have time for maybe one, two questions? There was, there was something that I wanted to ask actually. Sure. Um, yeah. You said that all of the facts that are true about Hurwitz numbers are true for the monotone ones. Is there like a kind of like natural geometric interpretation analogous to the Riemann coverings? Yes, there, there is a natural geometric interpretation. Um, and there, actually there, there are multiple natural geometric interpretations. And one is that it's not that you're counting some different class of covers. It's actually that you're counting the same class of covers, but with a sign, a certain signed weighting on each cover. And the miracle is that this signed enumeration is actually has a non-negative answer. Um, so that's the simplest way to, to think about it. The, um, the other way to think about it is that these monotone Herbert's numbers, it's a little more advanced, actually are, um, yeah. so there's a comp, yeah. Basically what they are is they give you the, the Euler characteristic of the moduli space of Herbert's covers in like compactified in the algebraic geometer sense. So you can also think of them as Euler characteristics of this kind of stacky object. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any more questions for Jonathan? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again.